Well, it looks like we're sort of getting to critical mass. So um, I think I'm going to start us off and say thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, we're really, really pleased that you're joining us this evening. I know that uh, many of you, uh, as well as our speaker this evening, who has graciously offered to speak to us, are probably a little bit zoomed out. Um, but thank you. Um, we're excited uh, about celebrating our 50th anniversary. This was not obviously the way that we intended to, uh, to celebrate with you, but having an opportunity for us to all be together tonight, uh, I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, I'd like to take just a few more moments uh, to remind you about, I'm sure you're all experts now, but on our Zoom guidelines, all of our non-presenters this evening will remain muted during the meeting. Um, we will encourage you to use the chat functionality, which is down at the middle bottom when you roll your mouse down over the screen. You can type in any questions there during the course of the meeting, and we're hoping to have a, a pretty robust uh, question and answer period later on. We'd also like to let you know that the meeting's being recorded so that others who are not able to attend us uh, at this point can join us at a later date, and we'll share this link uh, on our website. Um, We'd also like to welcome a number of people who've joined us this evening. I know that Senator Brownsberger is with us tonight. Um, Michelle Wu, I don't believe has joined us yet because I was just on another FaceTime live event with her a few minutes ago, but she may come on later. Um, and if I've missed anybody, I'd like to say thank you uh, for your support uh, in all of that we do here in our parks. Uh, and we're, we're, wel we're welcoming you tonight to join us. Um, many of you probably know about this. We had our kickoff right at the beginning, just before quarantine, but I'd like to remind you, it is our 50th. We're so excited. Um, it's turned out to be a little bit different, um, but what we found is during this time, our parks have become even more uh, important to all of us. The ability to be outside, to connect with nature and to connect with one another in a, in a safe environment um, has been amazing. And so um, I know it energizes all of us at, at the Friends when we walk through the parks and we get to see all of you. But I'd like to remind you about our anniversary projects that we selected. Um, we have the lighting of the statues along the Comav Mall, uh, which kicked off uh, last year in the autumn. So we're really excited. We have another uh, sculpture that we're looking forward to uh, lighting this year. We have the Arlington Street entrance, really the iconic entrance to the Boston Public Garden um, and the two child fountains at the entrance. Um, and in addition, the Boston Common, which many of you have heard lots about, we've been very excited. Liz has really been working super hard and putting a lot of energy and effort into the Boston Common master planning process. And we've been thrilled in our partnership with the city and having the opportunity to really re-envision uh, the Boston Common. So what we decided that it would be a really exciting opportunity for us to think about public art. Um, so we have commissioned a temporary public art project. We had hoped to be able to share it with you this autumn and like so many other things in our city, we're looking to share it, sharing it with you in 2021. If you're interested in any of these projects or have questions, please feel free to join our, our, our look on our website where there's much more information. The other thing I mentioned, uh, we're still really excited about, of course, I've still got my sweater. I've I did change it and I washed it, but um, we're really excited about after 49 years of uh, a wonderful relationship with the city of Boston uh, on our, what I like to call our pinky handshake, uh, we, we've, we've evolved and we now have a formal uh, memorandum of agreement with the city of Boston. Um, we're incredibly excited about it. Um, and we think it sets us up for really the next 50 years of success. So anyways, I'd like to thank you all again, because all the work that we do couldn't happen without all of you. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over this evening to um, our president, Liz Visa, who many of you know, um, and she'd like to share a few thoughts as well. So again, thank you. 
Thank you, Leslie. It's wonderful to be with you all remotely. It's very strange to be alone in my living room, but know that many of you are here together with us. And I'd like to particularly shout out Jay Livingstone. Jay, thank you so much for joining us. You came just after we had introductions and good to have Will Brownsberger. We're not sure if anybody else in the elected official realm is here, but Jay, you've been an amazing supporter of our parks for so long and of the friends in particular. So I'm really glad that you could, uh, as Leslie said, we're zoomed out, but we're still here and looking at the important things that we do. And we couldn't do them without you as elected officials, without you as members. It's, uh, it's critical, particularly in this time of COVID-19. Who would have known last year when we set apart, uh, set, set uh, to create a budget for 2020 that we would be in a pandemic, in a multiple pandemic of a health crisis, a racial reckoning and a financial crisis. So what we had to do is, is uh, slash our budget in half and do uh, essential care in the parks, but not beyond that. But the essential care is essential, as we have said so often, and you heard it from other parks uh, advocates in, in nationally and internationally, that these parks have been more important than ever before. As every piece of civic infrastructure is closed down, these parks will remain open and welcoming and available to all of you. So I hope you've all gone to enjoy either yourself alone or socially distance with friends and family. It's, they've been critical for our mental and spiritual and physical health and for the health of the community. You know, our parks are parks for uh, 60,000 neighbors. They are neighborhood parks, but they're more than neighborhood parks. They are parks for the entire city and beyond. And they are in fact symbols of Boston, particularly the Boston Common and the Public Garden. And it's really important that these parks are welcoming and open and available to everybody because they belong to everybody. And we are committed to doing what we can do and learning more about we, what we should be doing to make sure that people are comfortable coming to our parks because they belong to the entire city. They need to be resilient to support more than just the neighborhood. And it's wonderful that we do have neighborhoods that surround these parks, but we wanna make sure that everybody in the entire city knows that these parks belong to them. And one in particular, you know, the Boston Common has been a place for uh, coming and speaking our minds and making our voices heard for many generations. It is the center stage of civic life. And it's been a, a really moving, inspiring experience to see the number of peaceful protests that have shown up in this, in this park, both started here and ending here throughout this time of racial reckoning. So we're really glad that this, the um, park is there for everybody. The park is really important, not just as a green space, and it's a really important green space, but it's an important political and social grounds too, where we come to speak truth to power. And it's particularly important that we make sure we keep it in as strong and resilient a condition so that it can serve all of the multiple uses that we expect it to play for us. I wanna thank a couple of uh, groups, particularly our volunteers. You know, we were really worried at the beginning of the season and in the midst of the pandemic, whether the Rose Brigade who's been at it for over three decades would be able to come and take care of the rose beds in the garden. And they persisted and they came, they did it in safe, socially distanced ways. Uh, we are so grateful to the work that they've done. I think today may be your last day, regular day in the roses, but uh, thank you so much for that work. We also have a border brigade, a volunteer group that's come up sort of being inspired by the Rose Brigade and, and in the last four or five years, this last week was their last week, uh, caring for the borders in the garden. Thank you again for the amazing work that you do, a really important work that you do. Some of our volunteers couldn't do the work this year. Certainly there are office volunteers because we're not in the office and our tour guys, every year they tour at least 500 people through the garden and they're very uh, committed and they're wonderfully trained. And we're so sorry that you couldn't be there, but we look forward to getting you back there as soon as possible. And we are remote. There are uh, all of our staff are working hard on your behalf and on the, our, on the park's behalf. We're working harder to make sure we stay connected to one another because we are in this virtual universe. So there's a lot of Zoom meetings because we're not meeting casually in the office. But I just want to spend a second and say how important the staff is, how wonderful they are, how inspiring they are. And, and I want to thank you all, team friends. So as I said, we had to reduce our budget. We didn't have our gala, the green and white, even though we had budgeted to raise $700,000 for that event and raised almost $400,000. So we thank so much the people that couldn't come but continued to honor their pledges or donated to support it. 
but of course we did have less funding than we expected to have. And uh, in, in light of that, we are looking at, and we did the essential work in the parks and not more than that. But what is essential? The foundation of the parks. The foundation, which is the soils and the, and the turf. I mean, that's what makes our parks functioning. That's what makes our parks strong. And we ask a lot of our lawns. We ask it to support tens of thousands of people who come to protest, tens of thousands of people who come for a wonderful event like Free Shakespeare on the Common. And then those of us, one or two, come to find a, a beautiful sunny lawn just to sit down, lie down, and read a book. So we ask a lot of these, of these uh, lawns and we really wanna make sure they are in, in high quality condition, particularly with 7 million people a year coming to each of our parks. So last year for the first time, we did a comprehensive analysis of the soils, having another uh, parks care person, our parks care specialist who started a year and a half ago has allowed us to do more of this fundamental work of understanding what the condition of the soils is, where we need to uh, improve the pH. You see lime being applied in the lower right on the mall. On the left, you see baggies. Uh, our parks care specialist, Eric, uh, uh, bagged up hundreds of bags of soil and in, in uh, every panel of all three of the parks, sent it out for a, an analysis. And so we do know that we have high pH in the mall. We know that there are some nutrient needs and we are able to then target uh, in the parks relative to what we now know much more than we did before this work began. We've talked about this before, so many of you have heard about this, but it, again, going back to essential parks care work, we did not do all of the pruning in all three of the parks, but we did not stop with our elm preservation work. When we began in the 70s, we were losing 30 or 40 elms every year, but with the, the couple, uh, Chris Healy that you're seeing here, who is putting up an elm bark beetle trap on a tree. We have 24 traps in the tr in the parks and her husband, uh, Norm, they bring the uh, intelligence of entomology, soil science and arbor culture to this task, as well as to the soils work and the tree care work in particular. They have helped us understand some groundbreaking things about the carrier of the disease, the elm bark beetle, how the disease is transmitted and how it, how it uh, gains a foothold and forces elms to have to then come down. And I am very excited to say in the last two years, we have not had to take an elm down to Dutch elm disease. It has not succumbed. Nobody has succumbed this year or last year. We will never defeat this disease, but the Healy's are really pioneering new management techniques to preserve our elms and to minimize the use of chemicals in, in doing that. We're also supporting their research. They will, be, they will be writing it both for the lay person and for the scientific community. So I think we're gonna be really um, helping to, to export the, the uh, understanding and the, the management work that we're doing in these parks beyond it. And I'll just show one very interesting graph. In the beginning of their putting up their, their traps, they were trapping 40,000 beetles a year. And last year it was 2,500 beetles. So they're doing an amazing job in, re in reducing the uh, number of beetles in the parks that attack our, our elm trees. We, we would not have an elm in any of our parks if it hadn't been for the work that the Friends has done over the 50 years of our, of our efforts but the Healy's that have brought our work to a, a new height and a, and a deeper understanding, which is very exciting. Leslie mentioned our work on the Boston Common Master Plan, and I hope that all of you have contributed their, your thoughts over the year and a half that we've been working on this. These images in the top are last year taking the show on the road and setting up parklets all throughout the city and neighborhoods throughout Boston. Because as I said, this park belongs to everybody and everyone had an opinion about it. We heard many people who said, I love the, the common, don't, don't do anything to it. And others who said, yeah, it needs to be improved. So it is America's first public park. It is an intensively used park. It sees over 500 permanent events every year, minus this year when we're in a pandemic and the, and the turf is having a little bit of breathing time. But in order to uh, support this park and sustain it over the long term, we need to think about some of the basic management and maintenance um, efforts to, to be able to uh, make sure it's a sustainable park, but also some of the bigger transformative things. How can we invite people? How can we uh, engage and improve those use nodes throughout the park, whether it's the Frog Pond or Brewer Plaza or uh, Parkman Bandstand. So a lot of exciting ideas have come up in 
collaboration with the city and collaboration with you. And we've uh, had our third public meeting was virtual. I hope many of you signed on to the mid-September meeting. Then we had four breakout meetings for particular aspects of the work and, and the recommendations. Then we'll move into uh, identifying high priority projects, costing out this plan. We have $23 million from Winthrop Square, but that's gonna be a drop in the bucket when we finally put a, a price tag to all of the uh, aspirations that we have for this park. So stay tuned for the next step here. And the last thing I want to talk about is monuments. We have not done a thorough monument uh, conservation work this year. We've, we've taken care of some particular monuments, but this one in particular, I hope a lot of you have come to our, our events around this in 2015. Our stone conservator found some stress fracturing, some displacement of stones. And when he looked underneath, the foundation was in fact not concrete, but brick and is deteriorating. So we made a decision working with the city and the National Park Service, as well as with the Museum of African American History to do a fundamental reconstruction of this monument and use it as a platform for dialogue on race and social justice. And uh, it's been a wonderful series of conversations throughout the last year and a half. If you go to the site now, the monument is not there. It's in a conservation studio, the bronze, in a bronze conservation studio, the stone in a stone conservation studio. The foundation will be rebuilt and the plaza will be reinforced and rewaterproofed. But those conversations have been dynamic and important, revealing the deeper meaning of this monument and having it challenge us today. When we were in a real environment last year, we were uh, in, in uh, January 2019, we had an event at Tremon Temple. 500 people came to have that conversation with us about the power of public monuments and why they matter. We showed glory several times. And then this year we've had two virtual conversations. I hope you were able to come to those. And the beauty of being in this Zoom environment is that we get to record things and you get to see them later on. So um, in the chat, I hope it will be put in now that we have a, uh, a link to the website, to the partnership website. So you can look at the event we had in, April, in August and the event that we had last Friday, Voting Rights and the Perilous March to Freedom. And the last part about this work is looking at it in many different ways. Because the, the monument is off site, you still can go to the common and see 900 linear feet of museum quality signage. And on the right, that's our president emeritus, Henry Lee, looking at the signage with me and looking at the one panel where he was a leader and uh, doing our first capital campaign in 1981, raising $200,000 to restore this monument and set up an endowment for its care is a really exciting exhibit. If you don't go to the common, you can go onto the website and find images of the signage there. And on the left is a, an um, augmented reality app. You can dial up with from the Hoverlay app and learn about the history of the monument, the history of, its, uh, of the 54th, the history of the use of this site for political and social gatherings over the years, ever since it was unveiled in 1897. So it's been a very exciting pro process and project. We are looking forward to having the monument back in 2021 and continuing to understand and again, continue to be challenged by the deeper meaning and uh, the legacy of these men. And are we honoring their legacy today? And in terms of monuments, um, if you read my op-ed in July, I was called Monuments and Their Meanings. I talked about the importance and the um, power of monuments in the public square, particularly in this age of racial reckoning and, and uh, the, the awareness that particularly Confederate monuments have no place in our public space and being taken down. But we need to look more deeply at our monuments. We take care of 42 pieces of public art. What is beneath the bronze and the stones? What is the deeper meaning of each of these monuments? And who is memorialized and who is not memorialized? An example on the Founders Monument lower left is about the founding of Boston. And there's John Winthrop meeting William Blackstone who owned the common at the time, but he didn't own the common for a long period of time. The, the Native Americans owned it for many, many uh, centuries before that. And on the left of that monument, you see a standing Native American and a crouching Native American. We need to interrogate things like this and say, okay, what is the full story? What is not being told or being told in a distorted way? We need to re reveal this, the broader uh, story and find ways in our parks of telling those untold stories. 
In the right is William Lloyd Garrison, most radical abolitionist in our, in our history, but still he expressed racist beliefs. And again, it's gonna be really important. We're having conversations with Carolyn Crockett, the city's chief of equity, and Kara Elliott Ortega, the city's uh, chief of arts and culture to see how we can collaborate with the city on this work. They are interested in uh, doing this as well. So I, to stay tuned, we're gonna be inviting a broad range of voices to be around the table, voices that are not normally around the table, and it's time that they are. So with that, I am very excited to be introducing our speaker tonight, Mitchell Silver, and he will be talking about, and again, in light of the kinds of things we are dealing with, creating a socially just and equitable park system. The commissioner has agreed to take questions after his remarks, so please make use of the chat. One of the nation's most celebrated urban thinkers, Mitchell Silver is commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and a former president of the American Planning Association and is president elect of the American Institute of Certified Planners. As an award-winning planner with more than 30 years of experience, he is internationally recognized for his leadership in the planning profession and his contributions to contemporary planning issues. He specializes in comprehensive planning, placemaking and implementation strategies. He was named one of Planetizen's 100 most influential urbanists in, in 2017, and has been honored as one of the top 100 city innovators in the world by UBM Future Cities. In 2012, the Urban Times named him one of the top international thought leaders of the built environment. So without further ado, I am very excited to turn you over to Mitchell and I am going to stop sharing and he will start. On mute, uh, I just wanna say thank you so much. Wanna wish you a very happy 50th anniversary for the outstanding work that you do and commend uh, all the board members and friends because I have found that uh, those parks and those cities that have friends groups do far better than those that don't. Uh, uh, you're taking a look at Literary Walk in Central Park and I was so pleased to hear the remarks by both Leslie and Liz and like all other cities, we're now seeing the value of parks like never before. This happened in a 1918 pandemic and we're seeing it again today. In fact, I believe that our parks have become sanctuaries of sanity and more and more people are believing that as we're experiencing all the trauma related to COVID. So I'm gonna to talk to you about, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, equity, access and inclusion. I have about 20 minutes to speak and I'm very pleased to entertain your remarks. Uh, these terms are becoming very popular today, but I wanna show you here in New York as we hear about diversity, equity, inclusion, that we walk the walk and not just talk the talk. When I came to New York City, equity became very, very important and the mayor challenged me to do something about it relatively quickly. But I wanted to find a word that defined it because far too often people intermingle diversity, equity, inclusion, but what does it really mean? And in my opinion, equity really means fairness. Are we fair about how do we distribute our park resources? Are we fair about how we care for our parks throughout the entire park system? And in New York City, I'd have to say that we had some concerns about whether we were being equitable. When I came on board, the mayor actually attracted me to position because he was very concerned about a tale of two cities and wanted me to come up with a plan of how to develop an equitable park system. And so within six months, we came up with this framework for an equitable future. But to take a step back, I wanna share with you the context about New York City. Over several mayors and over 20 years, New York City spent close to $6 billion improving our park system. And we had this walk score. We wanted every New Yorker to be within a walk to a park and 80%, more than 80% was within that walk. But my concern when I became commissioner was not just about proximity, it was about the quality. Because I would walk to some of those parks within a 10 minute walk and I will let my child or grandchild step foot in that public space. And I will share with you what some of those look like. So we wanted to figure out how equitable have we been in New York City? 20 years, almost $6 billion. How many parks within our park system receive little to no investment? And it turned out when we took a look back, there were 200 of our 2000 parks, literally 10% saw little to no investment. And the mayor and I said, that was not fair. That's going from kindergarten to college. While you walk the city and see other parks being improved, yours was frozen in time. 
that seniors and children and families have not had that quality space, that civic common, that outdoor living room where they can thrive. And this has been even exposed more during COVID when we're seeing black and brown communities being affected by COVID, but did not have the quality space that they could enjoy and be healthy. So to the mayor's credit, he launched this a community parks initiative over $300 million to recreate, not just do some spruce up painting, recreate 67 of those 215 parks. And I'll share with you exactly what this initiative was all about. So this is a vestige of the Robert Moses era playground. It's all asphalt. I guess they expected us to roll around on the asphalt. Uh, I remember I was there with a council member looking for one blade of grass, but this counted as that park within a walk score. No gardens, no turf, just asphalt. And so I questioned whether this was a park or a parking lot. Now, this one's a little bit better because it has a couple of trees and a bench. So I suppose you can go there to have a picnic or maybe propose to someone if you want to get married. Once again, this was included in the walk score and I felt New York, we have to do better. So we decided to take a whole new approach and re-envision 21st century parks and public spaces. We wanted to focus on those features that young children can be engaged in. Uh, we have over 700 spray showers now for kids to cool off and as our summers get hotter and hotter. We have adult fizz equipment to make sure all of our adults have opportunities to get healthy. Color, color, color. Get away from that drab, gray asphalt. These are now town commons. Let's make it vibrant and colorful so people can now show and see the difference with their local neighborhood public space. And then green, green, green. Almost every community meeting, people want a garden, horticulture, green space, because we all know how therapeutic it is to be in green space. Parks aren't just for recreation or for physical health. We also know they're for mental health as well. And what's great about our gardens is that it also serves as stormwater capture. So our parks are now doing multiple purposes. So this is something that's intriguing about the future. And then for our aging population and for our families, we're now quadrupling the numbers of seating within all of our parks. Seems like to sit at the edge of the park, whether you are ADA challenges, a stroller, a family, we wanna make sure these become destinations that people experience. And so we're putting more and more seating opportunities in our parks. So I'm gonna show you a case study very quickly. This is in the South Bronx, uh, used to be a tough neighborhood. It's in the shadow of Hostos Community College. And then here's one of the examples of a park that had not seen investment for over 20 years. A very foreboding entrance, not very open, but this one, unlike the other asphalt playgrounds, had a little bit of vegetation in it, and it looked like this. So when I told you that I did not want to let my child or grandchild step foot in the playground, this is what I was talking about. This, by the way, it was included in the walk score. As commissioner, I was embarrassed, and I knew this had to change. This is what neglect looks like. It is unfair for that nearby community to have this as their public space. So our staff focus very heavily on how do we create this for all ages, for all communities. We have the green for the students to study. We have a lot of seating area for the seniors to enjoy, spray pads and ping pong tables. We want us to be really universally accessible public space. This is what it looked like. Uh, you now see the town green, uh, the square where the students can come and gather and lots of places for people to play, sit and enjoy. Very open compared to what you saw before. What's very excited about this is we literally opened this up about two weeks ago. There's a community college. This was opening day. And I can tell you driving by there, uh, people are in it, schools closed, but I'm sure once it's open, this will be a very popular destination for people to connect and create memories and enjoy a public space that they hadn't had access to for really 20 years. Now I'm gonna show you another one less expensive, the community parks initiative, $300 million, a lot of money but I also saw some injustice on how our municipal pools looked. In the foreground, in the background, uh, you see some public housing, and this was the state of our municipal pools. It did not compare anything to the private pools in our city, and I felt that was not fair. And so we took that internally, and for 170,000, we also got some furniture donated. We converted from what you saw to now what the community calls the resort. Usership in all of our parks, uh, all our pools have increased by 50%. We've now done this to 11 of our pools. We wanted to do a few more this year, but COVID put that on pause. This is how we're trying to provide more access and beauty and equity to our park system. So this park equity analysis basically allowed us to complete, now it's 50 
of the 67. Uh, we've now established friends groups in 82 of the parks we've completed. So now they're becoming stewards, looking after the park, cleaning up, making sure people don't vandalize or destroy the parks. And we've now increased usership by 50%. So more people are getting out, enjoying the gardens, the turf, the fresh air. This has truly been a success. Now I'm gonna talk about access. Now, when I talk about access, it's really not just giving people an opportunity to enjoy public space, but also removing those physical, visual, and social barriers. So it's really full accessibility. I have a saying that people may eat and sleep in their homes or apartments, but they live in the public realm. They live in public space. That's where community becomes community, by those interactions, by being outdoors in the public realm or public space. I like to summarize, we're looking at the different generations. Uh, I'm a boomer. The older generations were really consumers of goods, but the younger generations are consumers of experiences. That's what they look for, the excitement of these public spaces. And so I challenge my staff not just to be designers or planners, but to be experience builders and pay attention to the generations and culture and ages and ethnicity to make sure we're truly offering experience that's unique to that community and unique to that culture. And it's also forcing us here in New York to reimagine the public realm. This is all public land. You're now in the Flatiron District. This used to be asphalt. It used to be a street with some flower pots, some chairs and some tables. You've now created one of the more exciting public spaces in New York. So this underperforming asphalt is now creating an experience and is having a cascade effect on the surrounding area. And if we look at the public realm, New York City, 40% of our city is in the public realm. It's owned by the public. So when people say, I can't increase our park space, I said, do you have a sidewalk? Do you have a street? Then you, in fact, can increase and reimagine your public realm particularly now with COVID, when some communities do not have access to public space, they do have streets, they do have sidewalks. And I think both now and post COVID, it's time for cities to reimagine the public realm. Why? Because we own it and all we have to do is reprogram it. So something my hero, I'm sure yours as well, being in Boston with the Emerald Necklace and other green gems, Umstead said something that absolutely moved me. He said the sidewalk adjacent to the park is considered the outer park. So I told my staff, we will no longer call this a sidewalk. It is now the outer park. It needs to be integrated. It's public space. And we have to take a look at these barriers, the fence. There's no reason why you have to have this long perimeter fence. And there's a little dog that's just dying to sniff some grass, but he can't because they have this arbitrary barrier. We're not sure why it's there. And then here's this small playground next to a school. They put this fence around trees. I assume they thought the trees are gonna run away at night. This makes no sense. In the 70s and 80s, New York was fascinated with putting up fences and gates, and it actually did not serve the city well. And so we're now trying to look to rectify it. And the community said, oh, no, 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 fences keep us safe. Do they really? Take a look down this block. There's nothing you can see outside this park. People, trees, shrubs, flowers, you can see nothing because these fences that were supposed to keep us safe actually obscured our sight line, and you couldn't enjoy it. And then here's one of our other public pools again. This is where the kids have their summer lunches before they go swimming, but it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. Why do we want to cage our kids and imprison them just to have lunch? For me, this was something that was wrong and we had to provide better visual access. And so we changed it from this, we cut the fence down and now it's more beautiful, more accessible and visually you feel safer and more attracted to this public space. So that gave birth to a program called Parks Without Borders. The goal is very simple. The mayor gave me $50 million as a pilot. Now it is part of our design philosophy here in parks. What is Parks Without Borders? We're reimagining the edges, the entrances, the adjacent park spaces. So it makes more sense. We own it, it's parkland, it's the outer park. Let's figure out how to integrate it into the park system. For entrances, we wanna move or lower gates to improve the sight lines. We wanna draw more people into the public space so they can enjoy the gardens and the beautiful views and lawns and not have this obstruction of a fence for them. What I like about this one is that women and seniors in particular feel safer when they can see inside the park. Plus we're re-envisioning the sidewalk with more benches and seating because our parks close, but our sidewalks never close. And so for us, we want the community to experience all the beautiful uh, 
all the beautiful scenery inside the park so they feel better connected and it can help them reduce stress and anxiety. And then we want to think these little informal edges, and I'll show an example of how we're able to do this. We have these dioramas of gardens with high fences, and I want to make sure we take them down and better integrate them into the community so they can enjoy it. So I'm going to talk about Traverse Park. This is in Queens. Uh, we were able to take a park, a street, demap it, and then there was a little field of a local school, merge them together to create this new, incredible, dynamic public space. There's your typical Robert Moses playground, high fence, once again, a dog with no grass. They have the Belgian block and we change it from this and here's a rendering to this. We now are drawing people into the park by bringing the park experience out to the outer sidewalk, quote unquote, the sidewalk. Here's a closer look at what we wanna create. Before that, these were just trees standing in a pit. Now it becomes part of the park experience by pulling it out. Here's that DMAP street that served as kind of a quasi plaza. Uh, now it's been redesigned where we incorporate the schoolyard space to the existing park, creating a bigger footprint for the public to enjoy. Here's another view as it meets the street. And then this was completed about two years ago. This is after the park closed and you can see there are people out there of all ages enjoying the quote unquote outer park on this hot summer night. This is working quite well. I mentioned to you the diorama. This is in Bed-Stuy, well, the edge of Bed-Stuy, more Fort Greene in Brooklyn. Here's this beautiful triangle called Gateway Triangle, fenced off, a garden, no access to it. So I told my staff, we have to do better. Here's this wonderful green space, all this housing around it. Why don't we just take it down and connect the public better to the space? We took down the fence, my staff did all this work, went from a six foot fence to a pole and chain. We had our horticultural team and gardeners go in there. And as you can see, the transformation is dramatic. This went from the most hated space to the most beloved space, just by rethinking and connecting the public realm, get, giving people more access. So I'm gonna close on inclusion. Inclusion is always a tough subject because it's not just to be included, it's also not to exclude. We want to think about all people for the design process, all people for community engagement. We all know parks were created as a democratic spaces for all, but some places struggle with the for all. We say it, but we have challenges in how we execute it. I want to make sure we avoid designing exclusive parks and public spaces. And a real test is, is it welcoming to all? And so that's something we're examining. One thing that always bothered me is this term loitering. The term loitering is to stand or wait around idly without an apparent purpose. Guess what? That's what we do in parks and gardens. We sit there with no purpose other than enjoying the beauty, enjoying the scenery. And that term loitering could be misused depending on who is being looked at. Fortunately, in parks and many other places, that term loitering has been challenged uh, as unconstitutional. And so we re removed the word loitering from our park rules in 2017. Prior to that, as you see in the sign, it existed. So that young woman sitting at the lower slide could be considered loitering because she has no apparent purpose. And that's something that we have to think about, about being inclusive and welcoming to all. I was very pleased that uh, just earlier this year, we launched the Yes Loitering Project because we want to investigate how teens might be excluded or targeted from public spaces. These are future stewards. These are future environmentalists. And rather than being nervous about what they look like, we need to bring them into the park's family to understand the environment and trees and horticulture. And so we have this rule about, yes, loitering, that's what you're supposed to do in parks. We want to make sure we send the right message. And here's one message that was quite moving. I was in Detroit and walked upon this basketball court. This is downtown center city Detroit. It's called Campus March. And Detroit had the audacity to put a basketball court in the center of their city. Why is that so moving? Because most places don't do that. Basketball court is code word for urban youth, which means trouble, predominantly black city. Detroit said, no, the youth of this city, we're putting you center of the city. And as this city evolves, we want to let you know you're welcome and you're included. A powerful message. Every time I see the side, it moves me because most cities do not have the courage to send a message like that to young people. You matter. You're included. We want to make sure you feel that way as well. 
Liz talked about monuments. I'm so pleased that after a 60 year moratorium of any monuments in Central Park, I was approached and improved the first monument that depicted real women in Central Park ever. The first one, which was unveiled on August 27th of this year, uh, included Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and we called it the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument. And this was really a way of addressing all the three issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And in fact, it is now the most visited monument in Central Park. It's right on Literary Walk if you want to come down and visit. And then the last thing is that there's no question, it was already mentioned about the racial and social uh, unrest that is happening. Uh, my staff was very concerned about what was going on and wanted to show solidarity with the movement, particularly in parks, since we're at the center of a lot of protests. So we decided, put our heads together, and we renamed a portion of one of our parks in downtown Brooklyn, Juneteenth Grove. And we opened it up on Juneteenth. We are at night, there were 19 benches that were painted the Pan-African colors, there were banners, and we planted 19 trees as a symbol of a space that we wanted to be there for reflection, for healing, and for protest. I had the honor of praying for one of the trees that I planted as a way of respecting our ancestors and those that had faced a tragic death from a lot of brutality. So it was my privilege to not only plant a tree, but also to pray for it. So this is what I'm saying is as we're in this movement, it goes deeper. We need to create those spaces for healing, for reflection, for protest, uh, for, when, for celebration. And so we're looking more and more through our park spaces about how we become more sensitive to show that we're inclusive about how we design our parks. So to close, to be equitable and inclusive, I believe one, we have to be more fair in terms of access, remove those barriers, reimagine the public realm. And finally, if we wanna be inclusive, we must, we must, be welcoming for all. Thank you very much. Okay, I've been unmuted. So <laughs> that was wonderful, Mitch. Thank you so much. Very exciting and very inspiring. And no surprise, we have a lot of questions in the chat for you. Uh, and a couple of them were the questions that I had come up to me when I was uh, hearing you talk. You know, one of the, um, the first one is from our general superintendent of the Boston Parks Department, Josh Altador. Wonderful man, Josh, I'm so glad that you're here. He said, Commissioner, speaking of equity, we must also address quality. How do we make sure as a city we have good quality parks in low income neighborhoods? I think you were yeah. thinking that. Well, let me just repeat what I said earlier. Well, one, we have a whole program called the Parks Inspection Program. So we go out there at least twice a year and rate all of our parks and we have expectations about how well they must be maintained. That gets fed back to a kind of a park stat and we meet on a monthly basis to make sure that all of our parks meet our standards. That's number one. Number two, we make sure we have the adequate maintenance teams right. and we work very closely with the volunteers. Right now, we've had huge reductions like you, you had to cut your budget in half. Uh, we lost 14% of our budget, 1700 seasonals, but the public stepping up. We're now having these volunteer events. And so from our perspective, we focus very carefully on this analysis about which parks receive the fewest amount of capital dollars and we put them to the front of the line. And we make sure that all of our dollars are spread equitably. We meet with the council members and tell them, yes, I know you wanna have this value add project, but this project had not seen investment in two decades. And so it has been a very strong message. People get it because they want everyone to have a quality part. So using our data-driven approach to measure equity about how we're spending our capital dollars is a very telling sign. Right. Yeah, and uh, Marty Walls uh, is, is a great member of our council and uh, former uh, state rep. It, it, I think you've been indicating this, but the question is about that long-term cost. You know, you do wonderful capital improvement, and then there's the long-term maintenance cost, the increased maintenance cost. Have you been able to dedicate increased maintenance dollars to make sure your investment is, is uh, continues to be in good shape? 
We have, uh, and now before COVID, a lot of that had changed, but we did build that into the formula. Uh, we Even the equipment that we're putting in, we do expect a 20 year lifespan for all of our parks. After that, you have to do it over again. And so we're looking very carefully at safety surfaces and material and what we're planting to make sure we drive down the maintenance costs so it is maintained over time. We're also finding that when you build quality material, the public respects that public space even more. Yeah. It's not quote unquote vandal proof. If yeah. you respect a community with quality material, they respect you back in return. And all these parks that we've transformed, 50 of the 67, we're not seeing any vandalism. But we are seeing vandalism in parks that look like they were built to be vandal proof. And so lower fences, more visibility, they're really becoming these community hubs we expected them to be. You know, we work really hard to get um, graffiti off when it gets on just to make sure that we say, you know, this is not acceptable. We're not going to keep it on in 24 hours. This is going to come off. And, and it does send a message to make sure that everyone knows that these are meant to be excellent. Um, Josh also asked about the opioid crisis. It's a national issue. How do we keep park goers and kids safe while dealing with needles and homelessness in the park? There are two separate issues. First, let me say about the homeless. And this is going to be controversial. The homeless come under the category of for all. I know that's hard for people. We don't allow encampments. We yeah. don't allow people to break our rules, but we do allow parks for all. Right. If our homeless, those who don't have a home, can't come to our parks, someone tells me where can they go when they're released from the shelter for the day. I have this very quick story to, to share with you. I was in Morningside Park in Umstead Park in Northern Manhattan. Uh, the Women's Club of New York donated money to restore one of the waterfalls in Morningside Park, right near Columbia University. As I'm leaving, the head of the women's club handed me 33 cents. And I'm saying, what are you doing? She says, oh, I just want to let you know, the homeless individual donated 33 cents because this is where he comes every day just to feel alive. Yeah, that's right. It will say, oh, 911, 311 is a homeless person in our yeah, park. Yeah. I think we have to understand if parks are for all, parks are for all. Now, the opioid crisis is a challenge and is something we're trying to deal with. We did an experiment with kiosks in some of the parks that we're seeing a lot of our syringes. Uh, the numbers are staggering. They happen to parks that are close to these methadone clinics, which we have in New York. So this is something we're working very, very hard. We have an entire team that's picking up syringes all day. We're elevating the bottom of the shrubs so that people can, can see, our staff can see and not have a lot of uh, shrubs and plants. Unfortunately, these planting beds so we can see the syringes, but it is a challenge. So I can't say we have it solved, but we do have a team. We know where the hotspots are located and they tend to be very close where we have methadone clinics. And we say the same thing, you know, everyone is welcome in our parks. Not all behaviors are welcome. You can't do drugs, you can't deal with drugs, but you are welcome. And during the years when we can be out there, we have an area of Brewer Fountain where we restored it and we have tables and chairs. You could be out there and there could be a table of homeless people and a table of house people and they're all in there together. You know, I have a similar story about, um, we're doing that, Leslie mentioned the restoration at, uh, in the public garden of these two fountains at the entrance to the garden. We were doing some work a couple of weeks ago to investigate the, the one fountain and one of our contractors got to the fountain. It does not work at the moment. And he saw a homeless woman in the, in the fountain basin picking weeds and her, her belongings were on the, on the edge of the, and he in solidarity jumped into the basin with her and the two of them picked yep. weeds until the weeds were picked. She got out, took her bags and moved on. It was really beautiful. Story. Not to say that, look, there are some homeless individuals, but there are some people at hot holes that are a problem in parks. So yeah. I think that it's a tough one, but it did change my perspective yeah. once I, after that story uh, with the garden clean. I have to tell you, that was very moving. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think similar to what we've heard before, but uh, Jean Bollinger, who is our principal in charge of our master plan team and with Weston and Samson, good to see you, Jean. Historically, parks have not fared well during economic downturns as cities like New York City and Boston struggle with newly stressed budgets. Do you feel that parks fresh off their amazing service during this moment of COVID might get a better shake as municipal dollars are allocated? No, that hasn't happened. Um, and I'm sad about it. And I know as commissioner, I know we're all struggling. We had a $9 billion hit. But the one thing that kept us going during COVID it broke my heart when we experienced those budget cuts. We weren't the only agency. So it's something that was very difficult to bear, particularly our workers were essential workers. They came to work. New York was telling us, thank you, thank you, thank you. To see these budget cuts 
It breaks my heart. Luckily, we're able to avoid layoffs, but we just did not get our seasonals. So I hear you, I agree. I think there's now a new appreciation for parks and public spaces and for park workers. No one knew they were deemed as essential workers. I'm still coming to work every day. By the way, that door, that's where Robert Moses used to sit. That was his office. So <laughs> I like to sit here and undo or redo a lot of his work. Uh, but, Great for you. <laughs> his ghost sometimes comes in here uh, and bothers me. Sure. But uh, I agree, it's been tough for parks, particularly how important they've been. Uh, and we're now focusing on those communities, uh, black and brown, that were underserved by park space, that were really hit hard by COVID. So this is a wake up call. That's why I'm looking at streets and sidewalks and other ways. We had this whole cool NYC this year to activate uh, our park edges with spray showers just to keep, 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 keep people cool. And that's just something we have to continue to innovate during these very, very tough budget times. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be rough. I, I hear, I, I heard a, a, a moniker. And so somebody did ask about how New York City promotes its parks. I think part of it is about branding and communication and PR and making sure people if get it. You have to look at our Instagram or Twitter feed. I think we're up to 400,000. We have a team of photographers and during COVID, that's all they're doing is taking these amazing pictures. We had parks at home where people do these walking tours that can't get out. But look, you have an incredible park system there in Boston. I taught at Harvard. I love uh, your park system. When I went there with my daughter, she was checking out Emerson. We spent an entire day walking the entire park system. Oh, great. Love it. Beautiful, gorgeous. So you know uh, the, the value of parks. So uh, yeah, that's too. great to hear. So I guess I got a question for you about the whole issue of access and people feeling welcome. As I said in my presentation, the Boston Common is the place where we speak truth to power. Everyone comes, they protest, they celebrate it. It is the People's Park. And across Charles Street is the Public Garden. It's a passive park. There is an ornamental fence that's been around there ever since the beginning. So it's part of the design. But my, what I hear is that there's some kids from other neighborhoods who ask, is it okay to go? It's the Public Garden, but they don't know that they're welcome do we have to pay to go and so how what are your thoughts about how we can make people feel welcome well once you have a fence and i do understand because we have a lot of fences that are quite a start that we do not judge we are trying to cut them down but when they're very a start we leave those alone right. uh brian park is one example right in the center of, of uh, midtown uh but we work very hard to remove barriers where we can the rules uh, whether it's a fee-based rule or it's a rule that makes no sense whatsoever, we're eliminating those barriers. The food that you offer. There are some people that are saying, look, I'm a person of color. That's not my food palate. I'm not coming back because I don't enjoy that kind of food. Or whether your parks actually entertain a barbecuing or picnic yeah, areas because yeah, yeah. that is a very social part of a park and different cultures interact and use space very differently. Now, it may not be for all the parks, some of your more classic traditional parks, but we have to examine designing parks for people. One example in Prospect Park, a gentleman was very upset. There was quote unquote uh, Mexicans that were having barbecues in the area that it was not permitted in this park. He sent the video, I took a look at it. And I said, you know something, you're right. So I then designated that entire area an official place where you can picnic because I felt uncomfortable having everyone travel halfway across the park to the designated eating area, which was not close to your neighborhood. So you kind of have to look at the rules. The loitering is one. We had other rules that I've just changed because it didn't make any sense. We had a sign that says you weren't allowed to go into the park unless you were accompanied by a child. Well, that ruled out everybody that was 12 and over in an entire park system. So I changed that sign. And by virtue of doing that, we opened up 562 parks that a senior citizen could not go in because of that sign. So I think if your heart and your attitude is about access, how do we make it welcoming? Then your eye looks at a park and public space very differently. For the public garden, even though it has a fence, I'd have programming to get people to come in once we get through COVID, to have them experience what it is to be in this beautiful public garden. So there are things you can do to kind of break down those barriers, but to know it is a barrier, even though you want to protect that public space, at the same time, you don't want it to inhibit people from coming in yeah. to enjoy it. Absolutely. It's interesting you mentioned kids and you have to be a certain age to come in. I think about Gil Penelosa's uh, organization, 880 Cities. It's got to be good for eight-year-olds and 80-year-olds, and that is good for everybody. Yeah. You know, I want to honor the time. It's four more minutes till, till 7.30. I'm going to look for a couple. We've got a lot of great questions. Um, a question from 
Diane Wiley, um, brilliant and inspiring. Thank you. How do you think community participation in planning is best organized that people help plan the parks as opposed to simply receiving them from above? I think we've done a much better job today right. than ever before, but you right. know. I encourage you, if you look at the Community Parks Initiative, APA, we won a national award for the Community Parks Initiative. What moved me was a testimonial from those that participated in our workshop sessions. I now require for every park design that we have a public meeting. We used to have it in the daytime. We now shifted it to the evening and we make sure that kids are involved. So we'll have it in a school, have it in a public housing project. And I have to tell you, we make sure we listen and we let them help program and not design it, but how much passive, how much active. The kids are great with their sketches. All of them seem to like tree houses. That seems to be in big demand, which we can do. Roller coasters, monkey bars, which I thought people forgot about, seesaws, all the stuff I guess they see from their parents' photographs. Uh, we make sure we listen and it's unique to the demographics of that community. And as a result, we see that video. For me, it warmed my heart because I didn't, they taped us separately and what the woman said touched me. And so it's a community parks initiative. APA won a national award just this year. See the video. I won't answer any more of the question. The proof will be in the pudding of what the community members said about our design yeah. process. Yeah, that's wonderful. Sounds exciting. So now I'm being, I've, I've been flooded with some questions. I think we've got time for one or maybe two more. Um, how do you balance historic characteristics with designing for more modern and equitable use? I mean, it really goes back to the fact that we are taking care of historic parks and we really are challenged by making the balancing those needs. I'm actually going back to how we can restore it back to the historic nature. Uh, if you look at a lot of our parks, I'm wondering what happened here where you have 1970s intervention yeah. into our classic parks, Marcus Garvey, Von King. I mean, these parks were classic parks. And then we had this 1970s brutalist come in. I'm like, it's like I go to my grandmother's house and she has a piece from the 30s, the 40s, the 70s. Like, what's the identity? And so we're actually very carefully, if it's an historic park, we're bringing it back to what it used to be, if it's possible. If these some of these large buildings it's very difficult to do, but I'm no longer allowing these historic Olmsted parks to have these brutalist interventions that really confuse the character of the park. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that is something we do very carefully. Uh, and so we, I have a name calling Make Old Parks New Again, but I also wanna make sure it honors mm -hmm. uh, the early landscape architects right. that really were artists in my opinion, and not these uh, unfortunate brutalist interventions from the 70s and 80s that are concrete and just destroys the entire ca character of these beautiful historic public spaces. I see Robert, Robert Moses' ghost lurking around now, if you just said that. <laughs> he just tapped me on the shoulder and said, I thank you. <laughs> I did Central Park Zoo, he did. I think I'm gonna ask one more. Uh, Leonard Lee asked, how to develop your friends groups in such large communities? So how do you break it down? I know you've got a lot of neighborhoods and neighborhood groups, so. Yeah. We're very fortunate. We have this entity called Partnership for Parks. And we have outreach coordinators for literally every neighborhood in New York City. We have about 600 friends groups of our 2000 parks. And so we do training, we have grants for them. We do these, it's my park cleanup. I go out, I'm going out this weekend to one of our parks. I don't wanna announce it because I don't want people to just, I, I just wanna go there unannounced. Uh, and, and as a result, we just form a relationship and uh, that's how it grows. So we actually benefit from having outreach coordinators, plus all those new parks I mentioned. Once they come to the workshop, we ask them to come back and they voluntarily said, we're in, thank you so much. And so a lot of our workshop also is our way of doing recruiting for those friends groups. So as I mentioned, we're up to 600. They are invaluable, not only for cleaning and care for the parks, but they become the eyes and ears. And they're saying, don't you litter here. Don't do this, don't do that. And you know, they'll give their elders the respect of not destroying that park and it's working, yeah. it's working. Yeah. How many of those um, friends groups are staffed and how many are completely volunteer? Uh, most of them are volunteer. Now we have conservancies, which yeah. is a different category, but the friends groups are just neighborhood associations just embracing the park. Yeah. The majority of them are just neighbors that come together. They have a small board. The City Parks Foundation, where the parks, uh, partnership of parks are housed, actually can hold a bank account for them. So if they raise $10,000, they can hold the account, they can draw down on it from any time for supplies, for events, 
And they're great because they also help activate activities in the park. Right. And what I love about it is that good uses always push out bad uses. That's and right. now of our 2000 parks, they're all activated hyper-local yeah. to what that community is looking for. We talk about that as well. I mean, because of COVID, Brewer Plaza has not been operating, the Frog Pond has not been operating, and, and the bad uses really have seeped in because the good uses aren't, aren't out there this year. So, Everyone, I'm seeing all your comments. I wish I could stay here another hour. Uh, I love Boston. It's one of my favorite cities. My daughter almost went to school to Emerson. She's now oh. going to go somewhere else. So I could have been a regular there, but uh, hopefully when this gig is over, I'll be back in Cambridge and I can come visit all of you. But you would love comments you. are so endearing. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Mitch. It's been a pleasure to have you and it's very inspiring and we look forward to future conversations. So thank you so much for being here. And thank all right. you all for joining us. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you all. Thank you. Enjoy the evening. All right. Good night. <laughs>